So just so you know, there's a real person behind that. So without further ado, let's move on and welcome tonight's special guest. So um, I think I'm trying to remember, maybe Jackie can help me. Was it 2015 that you spoke at the AGM? I, I don't know. I think so. I can't remember. I think it was. I was trying to think back. But there's been a, a connectivity and that's really how long I've known Jackie and I've always admired your people focus, cultural whole um, space and how really when it comes down to it, your heart is all about helping people to make the best of themselves and get the best out of everything that they do. And I think that's really core for so many of us in the change space to be recognising that stuff. Um, you can read all the stuff and I'm not going to read it all out that's up on here and everything like that because people are more than capable of reading that stuff if they want to and it'll be available to read afterwards and everything. Um, but I think it's a, a real credit to Jackie's career and everything that she's demonstrated how well she can balance a whole range of different engagements and opportunities to actually make the best of organisations and individuals throughout her career. And tonight she's hopefully going to do the same for us. Yeah, no pressure. Thank you, Shana. So, <laughs> so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jackie. And please, any questions that you have along the way, throw them in the chat box as you go through. I'm going to put myself on mute because you look here far too much, but I'll leave my screen up so you'll see my face, unfortunately. And um, hopefully we'll get through things and uh, you'll have a great learning experience. So thank you very much, Jackie. Take it away. I have to uh, minimize my screen and then open back up so I can see your faces. There we go. Oh man, there's no faces popping up. I hate that. There you go. You know when you minimize your window of faces, then all of a sudden the only ones you see are the ones that don't have their camera up. So grateful to you all for being here tonight. Um, while I'm speaking and my son can hear me, I'm just going to remind him to keep it down in the kitchen because like, it's really loud, buddy. <laughs> it's like, thank you. Uh, I know that I have an hour. I will squeeze the life out of that hour. I'm just saying there's a lot of slides. I do this whenever I give any talks. I'm like a fire hose of information because I love data. <laughs> if it helps me to do my job, I make the assumption it may help you also. Hopefully I'm mostly right. I have a treat for you. One of the people that's on the call with us is Janet Holmes. She's on her camera, so wave at us, Janet. You, so she's got experience doing the work that we do, but um, she's also getting into this, I don't know, graphic art. What do you call it, Janet? Can you unmute for a second and share the language? I forgot what it's called. It's, it's all over the map, but sketch noting, um, graphic recording. Awesome. Love that. So here's the treat. I woke up thinking about her this morning. I thought, you know what? Everyone deserves who shows up tonight is a graphic recording of what we talk about. So if you make it to the end, that's the enticer. If you make it to the end of this, I'm going to give you a word. If you email me that word, she's going to send you a copy of her graphic recording. Isn't that cool? I just think she's amazing. And I just put two samples here. So you see, whenever she's at a strat planning session or some visioning or a meeting like this, she'll do a graphic recording to help people retain and remember what it is that they're committing to. So there you go. That's my treat for you. You have to stay to the end so I can give you the keyword. Just a little bit about me. I, 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 this is my 20th year in business. In June, it'll be 20 years. I can't believe it can't believe the universe continues to allow me to do this work. I, I used to be in sales. I actually grew up in tech education. But when I decided to go into business for myself, I was, I'm going to be a change management consultant. I had just finished training and coaching and in um, a methodology by Tana Miller Dice. I always say this, Tana Miller Tyson on real-time strategic change. That's how I started. So my clients were mostly in Ottawa. I had RCMP and Department of National Defense and, you know, health services, all, just all of those big clients. As I moved into that work, I found myself a little bit frustrated helping them manage through change without understanding culture. And let's be real, I barely understood it myself. So I started to dig into culture and understand who were the experts were in this work from uh, everyone from Peter Drucker to uh, Shine to, and then spending time with human synergistics and all the other players in the industry, it's really 17, 18 years ago, and started selling culture. However, that many years ago, no one gave a shit about it. So I had to phrase it as something else. <laughs> like, now people are interested, but C-Level were not interested in talking about it. And ironically, 
um, one of my areas of expertise became emotional intelligence. I was blessed to meet a man called Ron Short. He wrote a book called Learning in Relationship. He was out in Seattle. Um, I read the book and I felt changed by his work. So I called him up one morning and said, Ron, like, this is such a good book. Will you do training for consultants and coaches? And he's like, first of all, ma'am, like you're calling me at six in the morning. It's uh, nine in Ottawa. So heads up on the time difference. And, and in the end, he let me organize a six day training uh, incentive. And I brought 25 other consultants and coaches to Ottawa and we did it together. And he's, he's been my mentor ever since. So I, I feel so honored. That work combined with the change management helped me to help leaders navigate through relationships, especially in the context of culture and change. But I started to geek out to the neuroscience. I started to go, I want to know more about the the biology of the brain and what happens when we don't trust each other and what maybe sometimes I was looking for excuses about why I'm not at my best and why certain people trigger me and why I wasn't always brilliant at what I was teaching or it was the plumber with bad plumbing or certain clients would stress me out or piss me off and I wanted to help me be better at my job but I wanted to help my clients understand what happens in the brain and the body biologically neurologically that impacts the way that we communicate with each other and that and the final part of the story is it really led me to understanding resiliency and understanding how different people respond to crises and traumas in different ways in different time frames and it got me curious so if i look at the sort of the keynote speeches that i've given over the last for five six years there's a, a, a long history of resiliency has been one of my favorite topics so that, that's why we're here I want you to know that during this time of isolation, it's okay to not be okay. So while I am, you know, sometimes referred to as Pollyanna and Little Miss Motivator and the happy, happy, positive girl, come on now. For those of you who are on the call that know me real, um, I, I, I'm as authentic as it comes. It's bullshit to think that this is all happy, happy all the time. There are, yesterday was not a good day for me. Yesterday, I just felt drained and exhausted and I couldn't find my center, that sort of grounded place of feeling motivated. And I just, it's like, okay, but you tell people to let it be, so just let it be a shitty day, right? Woke up, rested, probably the first good rest I've had in seven or eight days. Sleep is clearly critical. So I just need you to know it's okay to not be okay. And while we're talking about resiliency, I want to share with you my belief system that this, to me, for those of you who have experienced grief in your life, we are experiencing grief. We are grieving the loss of what we thought our life was, what our jobs were, what our relationships were like, what our dreams were, what our vacations were supposed to be this year. We're actually, every day is a sense of grief or loss. And one of the things that I've noticed is we seem to be impatient with each other. And yet, if you've just lost someone that's, that you loved, we have patience for people grieving. We know that grief it looks different for everybody. We know that the time to grieve is different time frames for people. And so I'm asking people to remember we are grieving what we thought was or what we hoped was, and we are grieving. So have the same level of compassion and patience for yourself and for everyone around you that's going through this journey with, with each of us. So I wanted to share that belief system. You may not share it with me, but I just wanted you to kind of be explicit and keep it in the text of mind. And I guess I want to also add, I'm, I hope I do not come off as one of those people that's toxic positivity. And I, I wrote a piece on my Facebook group called Ask Jackie Lauer that I'm, I'm a little annoyed with the performance porn that's happening right now. It's that place that sort of overgeneralization of happy, find your optimistic state. This is the time for you to write your book and make your dreams come true because we have all this time for reflection. Well, it's okay to not be okay. So if you're feeling drained, exhausted, and it's not your time to do all those big dreams, let it be. So I'm hoping that I'm not coming off as that person, but I guess you'll all let me know if I go there somehow, in some way. I want to talk, what is resiliency? And in the context of thriving, um, really, it's about our ability to recover from and adjust easily to misfortune or change. Every single one of us as humans goes through what is often called in psychology a trauma. Um, what we're noticing though is the difference between people who only don't just survive from those things, they've learned to thrive. And so I, I share my experience with you in 
2000, I was diagnosed with a nerve condition that makes, I've lost the feelings in my hands and my feet. Um, standing or touching anything, like even just running my fingers through my hair feels like glass. Everything, everything hurts. When I stand, it hurts. When I walk, it's pain. Um, and then I started to, <laughs> I was thinking about an uncle of mine took me to a, a, heal, a healing, what do you call it? A focus, what do you call it? A group that people that get together and talk about their shared trauma. So it was a group of people that suffer from the same nerve disorder. And I walked out of there after two hours bawling, saying to my uncle, never take me back there. Apparently I'm gonna end up in a wheelchair and diapers and I'll never learn to walk and eat on my own. And it was a freaking nightmare. And I said, never, never ever take me back there. What that did for me was lead me to positive psychology. It led me to people that have learned to thrive with chronic pain. And I wanted to know why the one fella who in, in his 70s could still dance with his wife once a week. What was he learning to do to put aside the pain so he could still hold his wife once a week and dance on the dance floor, even though standing and walking was painful for him? What is the difference between people who are decided that the world is going to come to an end versus those who had the capacity to go, this is shitty, this sucks, I'm going to feel the disappointment, I'm going to grieve, and then I'm going to figure out how I'm going to get to the other side of that not just surviving but to thriving so that's 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 sort of what led me to the journey to look at what was happening in science to treat people that were experiencing different kinds of trauma it's rare for people to not have experienced some sort of challenge or adversity in their life so people who are resilient tend to be able to harness those inner strengths and resources just a little more quickly than some who others who experience a setback I was also intrigued in terms of my own family. Um, I have uh, two brothers and a sister, four of us. Our biological mother died when I was one years old, and the others were eight, nine, and 10 years older than me. And as I was being raised with them, I was really intrigued that they had three different ways of handling the death of our mom, and three, four really, because I was the fourth version. And I, it, it just made me curious about how four people from the same DNA had a very different way of responding to the circumstances in our families. And if you all reflect on your own families, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're thinking similar things it's like, how are we all so slightly different? A lot of it is DNA when it comes to understanding resiliency. We know, uh, we know that, that um, part of our ability to respond resiliently comes from our biology, but we also now know that over 70% of it is choice. We used to think it was 90% our DNA and our biology. Mm -mm. It's now choice. Kind of important to know. So research has shown that common people have the capacity to build up plasticity in their brain and then improve their ability for resiliency. Common people, look what we're seeing right now, right? You guys, like, come on. I love these images. I'll share the PowerPoint in case you're interested in sharing these images as well. Just a reminder that our everyday amazing heroes and scrubs are being resilient every day that they go into their jobs. Examples of resiliency, think about the miners. I love that story in terms of how they managed, you know, 69 days in less than like a tiny little square footage of you know, um, a, a space that they shared for 69 days with 33 of them. And if you dig into the story, you learn, and we'll talk about it in the tips for resiliency, is they had purpose every day. They had prayer, and there were some that prayed and some that didn't, some that believed and some that didn't, some that cried and some that didn't. They all did it differently, but what they did do was they had a plan every day. Here's our purpose today. Part of it was obviously to survive. But then what is my role and what do I do to contribute to our community? They were very purposeful. You guys know Viktor Frankl and the story, right? Man's search for meaning. So for anyone not know, just those in the camera, anyone not know who Victor is, just I see you, Jenny. I just faces and I get to see your face. It's lovely. Right, so what a story. How many years he spent over um, in four different concentration camps. During that time, lost his wife, his mother, his father, and his brother. I believe only his sister was the other survivor in his family, if I'm not mistaken, my memories. And if there's anything that we learned from him, he ended up working in, in psychiatry and neurology, is, is his 
uh, his contribution to the world about the choice, the part that I was saying about our, our capacity to choose the circumstances that we're in, no, but the capacity to handle them and how we choose to respond to them. You know, couldn't help but add something from Muhammad. Inside a ring or out, ain't nothing wrong with going down. It's the staying down that's wrong. And then another one from Christopher Reeve. Their, their capacity to choose how they respond or how their examples are heroes to us. So how do we develop the resiliency, right? I talked about, you know, yes, some are more predisposed bio biologically to be resilient and the environmental factors can impact us to say the least, but the good news is we now know that there is the capacity to change the pattern and, and our responsiveness in a timely way. By looking at thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors those things are learned. Um, how do we build that resiliency? I'm looking through the lens of uh, emotional intelligence for starters. So understanding that when we are self-aware, how are we thinking, feeling, and what are we wanting? When we're self-aware, we get to self-manage. Now that I know that I feel like shit or that I'm angry, I'm mad, or I'm totally joyful. I get to choose how to respond, self-aware, self-manage. And do I also have the capacity for empathy with you or other when I'm also aware that I'm feeling stressed or anxiety or fear or joy. And if there's anything that I've experienced in the last couple of weeks is the compassion exhaustion or compassion fatigue that most of us are feeling because we're in care of our colleagues and in care of our employees and in care of our family members, barely remembering to take care of ourselves. But we need that emotional intelligence for that self-awareness so we know what we need to self-manage. On the neuroscience side of things, I had the honor of being mentored by Judith Glazer, uh, very uh, well known internationally in her work in conversational intelligence. Unfortunately, she passed away a year ago, November of cancer. But man, I, I felt like I, I got lucky getting to spend 10 months with that woman. And so understanding the brain's response um, to uh, any relationship and the way that we converse and the tones that we use and what happens in the brain in terms of releasing cortisol, which I'll, I'll use a lot now, when the brain releases cortisol, which we're, when we're under fear and stress, which is predominantly where we are right now in our, in our global pandemic, we're constantly under that fight or flight response mode. And when we're in that space, we're not at our best. It's not rocket science, but when the brain is flooded with stress hormones like cortisol or is flooded with adrenaline, you can actually do the MRIs and studies of the brain will show that we lack clarity, that we lack the capacity for connection. There's so many ways, and of course, um, illness begins, not just mental illness, but physical illness, because our body is suffering from so much cortisol and adrenaline coursing through. But there are ways that we now know that if we can consciously choose, and I, I use that intentionally, consciously choose to release the oxytocin, which is the happy hormone, and dopamine and serotonin, which are calming hormones, um, that we can actually clear the cortisol and it will decrease, and we now know this through science, it will decrease anxiety and depression. Doesn't solve it, but we can decrease its effect on us in our moment to moment exchanges with each other. So that's the primary premise of this presentation, is how do we consciously choose to release the oxytocin, the serotonin, the dopamines, so that we can manage our stress. That'll help with resiliency. I also just shared with you the PERMA model that comes from positive psychology. So it was created by Marty Seligman, who is the father of positive psychology. I also had the honor of spending a year with him as a mentor online, which is crazy, it was in 2000. He had 100 coaches from around the world testing his theories in positive psychology versus psychology. And I got to be one of those people. And one of the designs that came out of his work was, how do you create a thriving life? Ensure that people are flourishing. The PERMA model we now know translates across all cultures, all languages, and all countries. We want positivity. We need the conscious release of positive emotion. We want engagement, which is the use of our character strengths and our passions so that we're loving what we're doing. Obviously, we need positive relationships. He goes, this goes, if, if you guys don't know this stuff, dig into it. There's a lot of free stuff online. Um, you know, we know that uh, if any of you have read Malcolm, Glad, Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, uh, Blink, 
he covers uh, Mar uh, Gottlieb's work in uh, a positive negative ratio. So G Gottlieb had the capacity to know how what marriages were survive, and he could watch a couple in 60 seconds with a 90% accuracy, he would know if that couple would make it in their marriage. 60 seconds, he would know if that couple would make it in their marriage. <laughs> I was like, what? The question becomes, what the hell is he observing in 60 seconds to get it accurate? So what he was looking at was the positive negative behaviors that exist between that couple. And so he looked for the five to one ne negative re positive ratio. And I use this with clients in the workplace around culture. I say, I want a three to one ratio. If you have an experience that's a negative experience, I expect that leader or you to correct it at a three to one ratio. And so we're looking for positive or negative behavior. That's a whole other workshop, right? We want meaning. Man, search for meaning. All of us as human beings to have a thriving life and a place of well-being is to, to get up every day and feel purposeful. And I was talking about the Chilean miners. They needed meaning. If they're gonna be stuck in that tiny little hole together, how do you create meaning in that environment? find meaning. And then we all want the sense of accomplishment. And what's really interesting is I noticed in the first week of the pandemic, everyone's, just, you're just in survival mode. Who Accomplish what? Most people would say, save my job, save my company, save, you know, save my family, be healthy. What I'm starting to notice as we hit this, getting, going, moving slowly into the fifth week, is people are starting to get intentional with what can we accomplish to make us feel like we're moving forward. And I know that means that we're getting to the other side of grief. It's a good, it's a good sign when I'm hearing those kinds of conversations. So that's the lenses that I'm looking through when I talk about how do we develop and move to a place of resiliency by releasing not oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and moving and decreasing the sense of cortisol, stress, and fear that sits in our, in our brains. So it, there's a couple of you that know me, you've heard and seen me do the, the uh, hand, the brain model on my hand, just do me out. Melissa, Janet, I know, just do me out, la, la, la. But what I, I do want to talk about is this is the brain. This, this is the brain. And so essentially, there's a whole bunch of components to the brain, but in, the, in its most simplest terms, we have our reptilian brain, which is the brain that keeps our heart and our lungs functioning. It keeps us alive, right? The limbic brain is the second brain. It's the mammalian brain. It's the emotional center. This is where the nurturing occurs for the mammals, right? So reptilian, mammalian. This is our amygdala. The amygdala is that little piece of the brain that's taking in data all the time to let you know if you're safe. Should you be afraid? Should you be in fight, flight, freeze, or appease? The amygdala is the piece that's taking in the data. And the interesting thing is it goes into the mammalian center of the brain, the limbic emotional center of the brain. So the data goes into the emotional center of the brain, okay? So if we pull it, the third brain that was developed is our neocortex. That's the prefrontal cortex, which you often hear about. It's the center for logic and reasoning. So have you heard of the term flipping your lid? Flipping your lid, it's like you're pissed off, you're angry. Flipping your lid actually refers to when the brain is flooded with the stress hormones, what happens is the neocortex has no power. Its functioning is essentially flooded and disappeared. When we're in a state like we are with the pandemic, we're in that sort of fight or flight, freeze or appease mode and just, and so the brain is flooded. And so those with the capacity to learn how to deflood and manage that state are in a place to be able to make some choices that feel logical with the neocortex. Otherwise, we're simply in feel mode. Please know that this is where I go back to it's okay to not be okay. You know, yesterday I woke up and went, man, I just, I'm, I'm off, I don't feel focused, whatever, I couldn't even access what was causing it for me. It took me some time to figure out what is happening that I feel demotivated and how can I choose to move forward out of this. So that's just a basic understanding of the hand model of the brain, just to understand why we're talking about how, what happens when we're flooded with a stress that we're not in a place of logic. What I wanna teach people is you can actually choose to deflood the brain so that you can be at choice. Make sense? So you ever been in a conversation where you, you, you know, you're with someone and you walk away thinking, that was, that was, that was not my best moment. <laughs> there are things I wanted to say that I didn't say, <laughs> or, or it's like, I could have said that better. <laughs> Anybody had any of those in the past week or two or the past day? It's, it's human. But the cool thing is, is the better you get 
at noticing that you're flooded or stressed, the better you get at being to be flooded, to be calmer and at choice with your responses instead of your body responding for you or your mouth responding for you. <laughs> so I just want to share with you too, as we get into sort of the top tips, I'm just going to do a time check because I'm going a mile a minute. Make sure you're all doing okay. They're teaching this stuff to our kids. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. You know, they're teaching resiliency. I remember my son, he's 14 now. I remember him coming home with the empathy award when he was seven. I'm like, buddy, oh my gosh, I was so proud. He's got the empathy award. I said, do you know what empathy is? He's like, no. I'm like, well, they've got a bit more teaching to do. I found this, the numb process is something they've been teaching, right? I just thought it was really cool. It was like, notice what's happening. Understand your triggers and its effect manage or choose to act what choices are you going to make and then build on the positives and just and that's where they're teaching six seven eight year olds and i'm thinking i've got 40 and 50 year old clients that could use a hand with the <laughs> they'll take the we'll all take the numb process into our clients it's a funny name for resiliency numb i thought it was amusing all right well, let's move into i'm going to move into the tips mode what is neuroscience and positive psychology telling us ultimate Cultivate optimism. So this isn't rocket science, but when you think about people who, who have, and I, this isn't about the toxic positivity and say, go right to the positive. No, if you're feeling angry or fear or things are shitty, it's shitty. Talk about the impact of the coronavirus and how it's affecting our lives and our families and our communities and the world. Don't dismiss it. That's important data. And then that's where choice comes in say, okay, so what's possible? What do we do with it that will, will help us all cope and survive and thrive? It's how we choose to cultivate the optimism and how we respond. It's not about dismissing what's actually happening. Um, on, I just got to minimize the camera so I can see what I intended to talk about. I wanted to share with you uh, one of the role models for me right now in our community. Um, so Dr. Anne Marie is a doctor from Guelph, Ontario, and every single day when she comes home from emergency, she does a, a Facebook post on, it's, yeah, it's funny just talking about it, I feel teary. Oh, come on, Jackie, manage that emotion. She is brilliant at bringing transparency and um, real data about what she's experiencing, but every time she messages it, she's clear to say, here's the real stuff, but here's my hope. Here's what's possible. Here's what we, we need. She has been an inspiration, and that's the kind of leadership we need. I don't know if any of you are noticing, but when we come into a place of crisis leadership, which of course is where we all are right now, there is little tolerance for um, uh, a lack of genuineness, inauthenticity. We, we just don't. We have, we're just barely enough energy to cope and look after ourselves and our families. We do not have the energy to tolerate idiots. I have no other way of putting that. We all know who I'm talking about right now as an example. Cultivating optimism. And so I think about you know, just raising my son. And when, when my marriage was over, when he was four, one of the things that I did with him was put him to bed at nighttime and teach him to talk about his prouds and his gratitude. So what are you proud of today? And what are you grateful for today? Because what I wanted to do was cultivate in him the capacity to reframe his day into the positive and also to learn to scan his environment for those things that he's grateful for because you'll see in one of my slides, they're one of the top ways to reduce stress and anxiety and to increase the happy hormone that sits in our body. So cultivating the optimism. Now, let me point out, there's nothing more annoying though when you're feeling stressed. You guys know where I'm going with this. And you're angry or frustrated and stressed and someone says to you, well, let's look at it from the positive side. That is not what I'm talking about, okay? There's a place for that when they're ready but more than anything else right now, you need to be with people wherever they're at, right? Great change management leaders, we know this. Just be with them where they're at, but do not, I, I honest to God, I remember doing that once to my brother. He was moaning, complaining, and bitching about his job, and I did the, well, why don't we look at it from this perspective? And he shouted at a family get together, don't be a coach, be my effing sister. I just, I love the story because he put me in my place and I deserved it 100%. I dismissed him in his capacity to reframe it, but he wasn't ready. I dismissed what he was feeling. 
So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just saying it is about helping people to say, where are you? Are you in a place where you want to look at what's possible? And it's like, no, it's like, okay, when you're ready, I'm here to help with that too. All right, so exercising signature strength. So one of the things that we know, especially in the work with Marty Seligman and the PERMA model, is that when we have um, the opportunity to lean into our character strengths, we enter what's called the flow state. That's that really cool place. You know, I think I was on this. You know that place you call being in the zone. It's that state of being so, totally immersed in something. You almost lose track of time. Do you guys know that that place? That's the flow state. And we enter flow state by leaning on a character strength. And we're allowed to enter that flow state because we mine. My top three are honesty, humor and kindness. No wonder I love this work because people actually let me show up with those three things and I get paid to do it. Shut up. It's the best thing in the world. So think about, and, and so one of the things I included here was in this time of being socially isolated, it's coming to us in our work sometimes, but sometimes it's doing tasks like washing the dishes where it's a repetitive task where your, your brain is distracted. So you're in something physical, which means your brain isn't ruminating anymore. So you can almost lose track of time because my mom, she says, it's cleaning my house and gardening. Gardeners get lost and their hands in the dirt and the fresh air around them or the smell of the flowers. For some, it's walking or running, walking your dog or going for a jog. I wish that was mine. God, I wish that was mine. So it's like know what your flow state is and find that in your, and if it's hard to find, try, like, I'm not a crafter. So I've, I tried a puzzle, <laughs> suck at puzzles, not my flow state. In fact, I'm pretty sure I took my son out of his flow state because I was so annoying to be with while I was trying to puzzle. Find the thing that allows you to kind of get lost and stop the rumination, the busyness in the brain and just be in the moment. For me, it is nature, 100%. I, if, I'm, if, if it's the wind or the trees moving or the sound of water, I'm gonna lose track of my crazy brain and just settle and just be very, very present. But talk about building your emotional intelligence. So spending time, become, practicing the self-awareness, increasing the reward systems, decreasing the threat, so that you have choice, practicing self-awareness that the thing I'm always teaching my clients is just know what you think, feel, and want. Think, feel, and want. And if you're feeling flooded or stressed or triggered, or you don't know what's happening, which was my case yesterday, it's taking that quiet time to go, what am I thinking? I'm thinking my clients want this and my family wants that. And that, so what am I feeling? Overwhelmed and exhausted. Then what am I wanting? And if you can access think, feel, and want, the more practice you get at it by being present with those three things, the more the more at choice you are, then you're managing the stress level. So, you know, the bottom line is we're in an environment where we're just, we have little tolerance for the command and control type of leadership. And we don't want that in our families, let alone in our workplaces. I just want to highlight the amygdala hijack, right? It's that, that place of when we are completely flooded, whether it's um, a person that's triggering us or someone's behavior. For me, I don't know about you guys, but I, I totally went through a social media addiction for the first week of this, um, obsessively checking the news, afraid I was missing out on the news. And then suddenly I went, every time the news comes on, I'm, I'm triggered. So in that first week, we hadn't been in self -iso um, uh, social distancing yet. And I had a colleague in meetings. She would tell me the news every 15 minutes. We'd be in, in meetings with the clients and she would, oh, this is happening. Oh, Trump said that. Oh, Trudeau said this. And finally I went, I get that you need to do this for you. I, I get that it's important to you, but it's causing me stress. So I'm gonna ask that you keep the news to yourself and I'll, I'll be responsible for my own news checking. And I wanted to deeply respect her need, but I also needed to put some boundaries around because I realized that every time she did that, like I, I felt like someone had knocked me off my ass. It was a trigger response. Also, when we're flooded with cortisol, fear, stress, not sleeping well, all those things that we're going through, um, we're, we're triggered more easily. So the amygdala is an overdrive. So be patient with yourself and those you love if you find they have less patience for you. <laughs> um, so just knowing, you know, I, I literally had a client who said to me this morning, he goes, yeah, so yeah, I think I've been in amygdala hijack for two days. 
I said, do you want to stay there? And he said, no, I've decided I'm good now. It's like, okay, can I help get, like, do we need some strategies to get through it? Uh, and I said, is your marriage still intact? And do you still have your job? Like, how far did you go with this amygdala hijack? <laughs> Sometimes people aren't good at noticing it. It's that sort of lacking that self-awareness. It's so, for me, I get a breathlessness. I'll get a, like a shallowness in my voice. My throat will tighten. For others, it's the sweaty hands or the increased heart rate or uh, dilated pupils. Just start to notice what are your physical reactions in that fight or flight response so that you can stop and go, okay, what's happening? What am I thinking, feeling, and wanting? I love this saying. It's something that I've shared with many clients over the years is name it to tame it. So, you know, here's the thing. It, when the brain is completely flooded, and you say, I'm angry, or I'm just surprised, or I feel embarrassed, or I'm just disappointed. When you name the emotion, what actually happens is that the flooding of the brain in the, in the emotional center, literally, you can measure this in MRIs, releases the oxytocin to the neocortex. And you can watch the neocortex start to light up again and go, ooh, I've got logic and reasoning back. I can actually function now, because it's not lit up in the MRI when you're flooded. So when you actually just name it, you're letting the brain know, I hear you. Yeah, I got this. I think we can handle this together. So if there's one thing you learn is name it to tame it. I threw in the phrase on the left where it says connect and redirect. That's a term that psychologists will often teach parents. So when you have a kid in an outburst and they're flooded or overwhelmed, what you do is connect with what they're feeling. It's like, are you feeling angry? Tell me about the anger and then redirect the anger so they focus on something else. It's a phrase that's often used in parenting. For me with the adults, I'm saying name it to tame it, man. There's a video on my website that has me talking about, I'm doing a speech on courage with the Disrupt HR, and I, and I start off with, I'm shitting my pants, I'm so scared with you. And the reason I announced that to the audience is because I was literally freaking excited and nervous and kind of like overwhelmed by all of that so i needed to let my brain know it's, it's okay man i got this just and as soon as i did it you could feel the settling of all the hormones and the stress coming through the body and just go okay i can breathe again <laughs> so name it to tame it and it's okay to say i'm angry i'm frustrated i'm sad i'm confused just here's the other thing that i'll often say to people though is have to say it out loud i'm not asking you to sing kumbaya with your family and your colleagues and say i just need you all to know that i'm sad today <laughs> that's not what i'm talking about i'm saying do it with self now i've noticed that some of the great leaders have the capacity to be that vulnerable just say hey i'm finding myself a bit confused today bear with me like that authenticity is amazing i'm just saying you don't need to walk around naming how you're feeling every moment but acknowledge it for yourself Oh, hey, Rich, time check. All right, good, good. <laughs> um, the one thing that we know about the brain is that the human brain is a social brain. So we actually, and we're, we all know this now. I think it's, what's interesting for me is just how aware my clients are of the work that I've been doing now that we're in social is isolation and physical distancing. People are like, oh, this doesn't feel healthy. I feel like I'm missing something by not, I mean, did you know that an eight second hug releases oxytocin? So, um, you know, uh, eight hugs a day is good, but if you can have one good eight second hug, that's a very healthy thing, man. Now don't go around hugging the whole world, at least not right now, that would be awkward. It's not advice I'm giving you, but if you are happen to be at home with someone, just snuggle up, man, get a good hug in there. But the thing about the social brain is we actually require the connection. When my dad died two and a half years ago, my mom made a commitment. She said, it's my year of yes. Now she was married to my dad for 45 years. Uh, she had never been alone ever in her life. So she was a little bit scared. So she said, it's the year of yes. Every invitation I get, I'm gonna say yes to because I'm afraid I'm gonna isolate myself and go into my grief and just hide away. So, I mean, I took advantage of it, let me tell you. Like I invited her to everything. And there were days where she's at the other end of the phone going, okay. <laughs> Yep, she came and she honored it. She said it's one of the smartest things she ever did for herself. 
um, because it forced her to get out. And now the woman, two and a half years later, she's in chair yoga. Okay, she's not in, now because we're in the pandemic. She's 79 and alone in her apartment, let me be clear. But she's in chair yoga and Scrabble. So I've been teaching her online how to play these games with her friends. Of course, my mom, 79-year-old Zoom master, for goodness sakes. And trying to convince her 80-year-old friends that it's okay to own a smartphone. You know, so proud of her. So these connections that we're having with each other, uh, with our families, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but on Easter, I had a family dinner online. We watched Andrea Bocelli online together. Um, I played Card Game Humanity with girls on Thirsty Thursday online. So whatever, you know, I saw that eyebrow. You know what I meant, didn't you, Rich? I, it'd be fun to play that with you, I'm just saying. I'm seeing some really cool ideas in the workplaces around that social connection. I've seen live watch parties and concerts. Of course, at home, most of us are getting together with our family and Zoom calls. I've watched virtual happy hours with friends. I got one client this, th this Friday, I think they're calling it, um, I think they're calling it beer and a snack, frankly. I think that's all, they're, or happy hour on Friday. I've seen Netflix parties and virtual water coolers at work. Um, and so in the chat, share more. If you guys have some really cool ideas of things that you've implemented and tried with your family and your, and your work colleagues, please share with each other. I'm seeing so much creativity, it's amazing. Physical pain we now know, right, is, is you know, the social pain is as great as the physical pain. We, we, we can literally measure that when we're doing uh, MRIs on the, on the body. So we know that if there's anything we're not allowed to connect is having a terrible impact on our resiliency and our capacity for thriving. And of course, this one isn't rocket science to most of us either. We need exercise. We need to be active. We need to get up and move around. I don't know about you, but I have Zoom ass. Like my bum hurts at the end of the day. I haven't done enough. Even my son said to me, get up and move because he knew I had a full day today. He said, make sure you're moving around. One, I, 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 you guys, some of the videos are hilarious of people like forgetting their cameras are on or getting up in their boxer shorts and stretching and groaning and all that. But we need the exercise. So well, I'm watching people engaging in online yoga classes and Zumba classes and getting out and making sure that you get that, um, the fresh air and the walk outside in nature. We know that the top two, really the top three ways for resiliency is breathing. Breathing. And, and I'm, it's like just breath because breath makes you present. It fills the body with oxygen. It's that mindful moment of checking in with how you're doing. So breath is the number one way. Number two, nature. Because the cool thing about nature is like any of you have done, put your hand out, I'm just gonna look at all your faces for a second. How many of you have actually done walks in nature during this isolation time? Yeah, I see a couple of hands going up. Here's the cool thing, your forest doesn't change. It just says less people, right? Your beach doesn't change. Your, Walkways aren't changing. So the interesting thing for the brain is that our relationships are changing, our work is changing, even our families and the way we connect with our families are changing. It's because there's so much change happening. Our, we're, in, we're in change fatigue. But when you do a walk in nature, that hasn't changed. So when you step outside into that forest and your brain takes that in, it goes, oh, this is so good. And it literally just de-stresses instantaneously. Even just talking about it. And I, I don't know about you, but I just moved into a condo five weeks ago. And I'm so grateful that I have a view of a forest. I, I'm like, talk about timing. I couldn't, have, I mean, that was perfect timing. If I'm going to be stuck inside, I might as well have that great, big, gorgeous view. So making sure that you're active, making, when possible, active in nature. So we, we now know, I mean, so clear on the health benefits of exercise and what it does for the brain and decreasing anxiety and depression. Acts, conscious acts of kindness. You know, I mean, we're, isn't it interesting how much we're seeing that right now? And I, I'm pretty sure that people aren't sitting around together going, my brain needs a conscious act of kindness so that I can build resiliency. Nobody's doing that. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do because they know it feels good. They know it feels good for themselves and those who receive it. I have a cat who needs a little bit of a snuggle right now. Okay, <laughs> you are the center of the world. Yes, you are. So these are those moments where it's doing something nice for a friend or a stranger. It's being a part of a community group. There are um, amazing studies that have been done on just the pay it forward at Tim Hortons and the release of oxytocin that happens in the person who gives the gift 
and the person who receives the gift. Right? I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm certainly enjoying watching people who are doing all the sewing of the, the masks for people to wear in public. You know, if I look at our local hospital in Kitchener, um, they've got the Our Hero Wear Scrubs t-shirts that they've been raising for protective gear for our healthcare workers. And then of course, 7.30 evening clap uh, that rings around our whole community as they thank our healthcare, uh, healthcare workers and frontline workers across the board. It's inspiring. And you know, my, my mom, uh, I might get teary here, so bear with me. My mom was diagnosed COVID a week and a half ago Friday and she's doing great. Like it was about three days of scary, but she's doing awesome. But unfortunately my aunt passed away just this past Friday of COVID. Woo! And the hardest part of that is, you know, that my mom couldn't be there to hold her hand and my cousin and my two cousins and, uh, and my uncle couldn't be with her while she was dying. They were in isolation. But even harder is they, they have to grieve alone. So unfortunately, this is a story that I think we'll all eventually know, which fucking sucks. And I'm, I'm listening to the anguish in my mom as she called me Friday night and told me that Susan had died. And my mom is sobbing away. And finally, she just goes, well, at least it was fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said and i'm getting closer with harry which is my uncle he's he's so grateful for my phone calls these past few days so that's good and my mom had this natural capacity to find kindness to give to him during and she's not a fan of harry's they haven't been close but she so, totally had his back during the couple of days where susan was dying but the other thing too is my mom has a natural capacity or strength of gratitude and gratitude is one of those top five ways. If you can find gratitude in your day and find two or three places a day to express it, it's a gift for your own resiliency for yourself and to those who receive your gratitude. Um, and not to be morbid, but I, I also remember my dad's passing two and a half years ago. And uh, for those, and I hope I don't offend you, but I'm pretty bold with my openness around death and dying. Dad died in hospice, so we had all been sitting around with him for four days as he was dying, telling stories and laughing and crying. And not long after he died, we're all sitting in his hospice and we're kind of quiet. And none of us are quite sure how to respond or what do you talk about when his body's lying there and we weren't sure what happens next. And my mom just reaches over and she puts his hand on his chest and she just looks around. At, uh, there were six kids in our family and four of us were not her biological children. And she just turned and she just goes, oh, I'm so grateful that he brought you all into my life. I'm so grateful that your dad made me feel sexy every day. I'm so grateful your dad can make me laugh like nobody else. I'm so grateful. If the woman just kept going. So at first we're like, oh, that's nice. And after a while, like, that's a lot. <laughs> we're like, is she okay? <laughs> what she had was the natural strength to know that in order to cope with her grief in that moment, she had to release the oxytocin because she, she was afraid that she couldn't cope. She just knew into it. I've asked her about it since then. She's like, did I do that? I'm like, yes. And she goes, what did I say? <laughs> she, but she had a natural knowing of how critical that was. And so what I shared the story of when my marriage ended, I asked my son to do his prouds and gratefuls. It's now something he does naturally. Um, and it's something that when I'm working with a team, uh, in the workplace, I'll actually start and end meetings with gratefuls. So what are you grateful for in starting a meeting in terms of the company and end the meeting is what are you grateful for from the meeting as an example. So one of the best ways. We're getting to the end, so hang in there. I'm almost done. I want to just, you know, I'm really passionate about mindfulness and its, um, its capacity to serve us in terms of managing stress and anxiety. It's so critical. And I'm not talking about you have to do a deep hour meditation every day. I'm just talking about take those moments to be really present with yourself. I don't care if you're listening mindfully to somebody or if it's the way you savor your food. You know, I had an ice cream last night. God, that ice cream was so good. Yeah, I don't care if it's, um, you know, right now for me, it's listening to my cat purr in my ear. It's so friggin' adorable and it's calming. And we actually know the reason why they bring dogs into healthcare facilities and long-term care facilities is that the pets literally will release calming hormones, but the gift they give is the mindfulness. We get very present 
uh, with animals. And so it's, um, it's something that I can't express to you enough in terms of how you cope through this time. Fine. And so I, I had a brother recently say, I'm mindfully eating the shit out of chocolate and drinking my beer while I'm watching Netflix. <laughs> like I said, if that's giving you joy and you're really present with it, do, do it, do it. Um, this is just a continuation of the gratitude wall. I've got one company that's actually moved the gratitude wall to virtually. And so they've created a section on their online uh, corporate site so they can put little gratitudes. And um, I was actually talking to the CEO, I think it was Thursday, and he just said, I didn't ask them to do it. The employees decided they needed to bring the gratitudes online because they were missing uh, what it did for them in terms of creating shared experiences and counting blessings when maybe, maybe you know, if I'm working with Rich and I'm having a shitty day and he posts the gratitude, I might go, God, that was, I needed that one. Thanks for, because I didn't see it the way you did. So that's the gifts that you get. You know, in closing, one of my character strengths is just, it's just humor. It's, it's, it's that capacity to release the chemicals that are negative in our body and allow us to build the, um, to release the oxytocin I, I put up the funny one, I miss shitting on people from our pigeon is just my way of saying, there's a lot of really great humor around this. And I had one client uh, call me quite upset in the second week of the uh, isolation and physical distancing. And he said to me, I'm not okay with the humor. He said, I find it offensive. And, and I, I said, you know, can I genuinely offer an opinion about where I think you're at with this? And he said, yeah. And I said, you, it's okay to not be ready for it. It's okay to be offended by it, but it's also not okay to shut people down because they're in that place of shared laughter. So create a space for your employees to, to find humor and memes, but also let them know you're not there, and that's okay too. So that's just something I've been really aware of. Um, there's a reason why looking up cat videos is popular on YouTube. It's that silly distraction we need when we're just having a crappy moment or day and we just need a good laugh. There's a laugh track that I found that I've taken into keynote speeches that I love to play. And my son and I, we know the laughs off by heart. So if, if Jack and I are pissing each other off, we will actually do the fake laughs until we start laughing. Like, because we know it so well. So if we're stressed out and he starts to do the fake laugh, I'll just start laughing instead of being mad at him. It's so brilliant. So smart. So those are my tips. I remember it's okay to not be okay, but also our capacity to build resilience is, is a choice that we have. Uh, be real with yourself in terms of how you're feeling, compassionate with yourself and others, but also know there are things that we can do to allow us to move from just surviving to thriving through this. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Whoa. Thank you.